This week, we got Baby Cressa Geckos, a little bit ahead of schedule, a little bit of a surprise, which means now we've got to set up a Baby Cressa Gecko enclosure. And today, I'm going to show you how to set up a bioactive Cressa Gecko enclosure from start to finish. I'm Adam. This is Wicked's Wicked Reptiles. Stick around. brief story about how we got these crested geckos. I keep a male and a female in an exoterra enclosure. Now the reason I do this is because when they were babies I bought them unsexed and they've always been together. I've never seen them mating. I've never seen them harm each other. Uh, the female's tail fell off like a few weeks after we got her so and the other one still has a tail so there's no signs of them being rough housing at all or bullying each other so I've left them there. They've never bred and then now I've got two baby left crested geckos so uh, on Wednesday morning, I think it was last week, I started spraying my enclosure on my way out the door like I normally do, and then I saw something jump, and I'm thinking, how did a frog get into this enclosure? And it wasn't a frog at all, it was a baby crested gecko. These guys are so cute. So then I found the other one, I separated them, and what you can do is you can put your baby crested geckos into an enclosure like this, just basically a stand-up uh, 12 or 16 quart enclosure and for the time being one of those Rubbermaid tubs just make sure it's sprayed down They've got a place to hide maybe a little bit of a substrate super simple a lot of people do this long term with their baby Cresteds So what I've done is I emptied one of my enclosures I've got this small exoterra front opening so a small tall or whatever you want to call it It's the equivalent of a 10 gallon um, you can see a very similar one in the uh, American frog care guide which is gonna be right up here this is a perfect enclosure for two tiny crested geckos and I'm going to make it bioactive right off the hop because I think that they look nicer and like we've a theme in this channel for the last few months is I want to have everything looking very nice so that when I walk into the reptile room it's fun to look at rather than looking like a bunch of work, right? Because that's what a rack looks like. You look at a rack, a snake rack, and then you're pulling tubs out and cleaning and it looks like a project where this looks more like a beautiful piece of art to look at. So that's my rant for what we're about to do. Let's go ahead and get started. The good news is for something like this, if you want to make a bioactive enclosure this small, it doesn't cost a lot of money. You're going to need a few things. So let's just go over what those are. Uh, you're going to need some sort of substrate. Well, two types of substrate and here's why. You're going to want a false bottom. So you can use egg crate. That's a great medium to use. Or you could use a clay pebble. That's what I like to use just because it looks a little bit more natural. And also it's really hard to find egg crate around here for whatever reason. So we're going to use... Bio drain, and this stuff is basically just a clay pebble. It is the Exoterra version of it. It's the same stuff as Hydro Balls, which is what I use for one of my other enclosures. These are a little bit bigger. It's better value for my money for where I am anyway. And you're gonna want this false bottom because your substrate that is gonna be able to be touched by your animal. You don't want it to be super bogged down. Your plants are gonna be in there as well. And then your cleanup crew is gonna be in there also. So another thing that you're gonna need is screen mesh. Screen mesh is really important as well. You can use the one that comes with BioDrain or that is made for BioDrain, but it's not totally necessary. I would just use a regular roll of uh, fiberglass mesh that you'd get for like a window kit or something like that. That's what I use. You're going to want to cut it so that it's too big because if it doesn't have that little overlap, right, which we're going to show you later on in the video, you're going to just have the substrates mixing and there's really no point. And then on top of the fiberglass mesh, you're going to want it to uh, have coconut core or something like that you can plant uh, your plants inside of and then your cleanup crew can use as a substrate for them as well. So we're going to put three plants in there today and then we're going to put one decoration in the middle uh, and then we're going to put a leaf litter and of course our cleanup crew isopods. Um, so let's go ahead and show you what we got for plants. So for plants, you want to make sure that there's a few things actually. Make sure that they're not going to harm your animal. That's one thing. Make sure they're safe. There's lots of lists out there on the internet where you can find out if the plants you use are going to be safe for your crested gecko or whatever it is that you're building an enclosure for, um, of course. And so what we've done here is we've got three that are safe for crested geckos. I've got a background in plants, so I'm pretty good at, at uh, knowing what can go with what. And of course, the internet, just double check. This time I wanted to add a little bit of color because a lot of my enclosures that I've done like this have just green plants, which are fine. They look great. The idea is to give places for these animals to hide and that aren't going to break under their weight. So 
We've got a Croton Petra. This is one of my favorite plants because it gets really colorful and it will get really big eventually. So you'll probably have to transplant it, um, but it will work great, really great for now. And then I've got myself a uh, Diefenbachia as well, just a regular Diefenbachia. And I've got myself uh, for the back, like I was trying to explain before, we've got a very dry English ivy, just a regular Eng English ivy. I'm gonna try to get it to grow on the background. I could super glue it if I need to. Um, but that may not be necessary, so we're going to go ahead and plant these. And of course, I don't know if I mentioned it yet, the substrate we're going to use coconut core. I use Beyond Peat. No, they don't sponsor me, although I mention them almost every video. This is a great substrate. It's a great substitute for Eco Earth. It's basically just coconut core. And then you're going to need a leaf litter because you're going to have a cleanup crew, isopods, or whatever it is that you use for your cleanup crew. So let's go ahead and just start putting this stuff together. So go ahead and get your bio drain or whatever it is that you're gonna use for this project for the bottom layer, which will just go into the bottom of your enclosure here. So just open that up so you can get the, uh, the balls out of there because they're just clay pebbles, basically. They're pretty large. Um, they're that size, basically, right? So you're just gonna fill the bottom of it. Uh, you could, of course, cut the background if you wanted to. I don't think that's really necessary to do, but you could cut it so that it's you know, not inside of the bottom layer of the substrate. You also have the option, of course, to rinse this because there's a little bit of dust. I don't think it's super necessary to have it too deep. This is pretty much really good the way it is. I think that you just want it deep enough that it actually acts as a layer and there's a place for the water to go. This stuff is actually very different. The other stuff that I've used, the bio drain, not the bio drain, um, the hydro balls are completely round. These look very natural. I'm very pleased with these just the way that they look. And then you want to grab your mesh and you're going to stick it in there. So once you've got it, you're going to have to fold the edges probably and you can have it a little bit higher at the back because you can kind of slope your substrate, which is what I suggest. So let's go ahead and get the substrate in there. So once you've got your substrate in there, you wanna be able to pile it up uh, so that it's covering the mesh from the inside. And if you don't get all of it, don't worry, the plants will cover it, of course. So what we've gotta do now, make sure your plants, you rinse off all of the soil. It's really important to do that. So you can see here, there's almost no substrate that, I was, that the plant was bought with on it anymore. Um, so I think this one, because it's taller, we're gonna be able to Put it closer to the back, um, kind of like right there. I think that's a good place to put it. So you just want to be able to get your hand in there and dig up a place for the root bulb to go. And that way you can just bury it. Of course, make sure that the plants that you use are able to grow in the substrate that you choose. I know that Diefenbachias will grow very well uh, in this type of substrate. I've done it before. So next we've got uh, this ivy, it's just an English ivy. It was a little bit sad looking to be honest with you. It was a little bit dry So let's go ahead and put that kind of we're gonna put this one in the back and see if we can get it to grow Up so uh, that's a little bit deeper here, which is nice So it'll have lots of room to grow and when you plant stuff in the back You can leave a little bit of room behind it doesn't have to be right up against but you want it pretty close and you want to sit that root root bulb right in there and just cover it up basically and make sure that it's nice and covered and it's not going anywhere not super super packed down next we've got the defen or not the defen baki the croton petra which is one of my favorite plants these things are beautiful i think and we're going to put this one kind of on the opposite corner here looking at this i don't think we're going to actually need the centerpiece here because it's going to be too crowded so that's actually not so bad we're going to make a little bit of a spot here for this thing to go. So now we've got it planted. Uh, it's basically good to go. Everything is inside of it that needs to be there except for the living things and then what the living things eat. So I use isopods. It's one of the things that I use um, for the cleanup crew. Of course, I forgot to get them today. So it'll be a while until I can actually put the geckos in here, which is fine. These guys, you're better off leaving them for a few days to, or at least a few weeks rather, in order to 
kind of adjust and uh, make a colony, a larger colony, and start thriving, of course. You can always put uh, charcoal as one of your layers in here as well, um, underneath between the, the two substrates, uh, over top of the barrier, the screen netting. That's a great way because they like to use the uh, charcoal as a bedding. Springtails are another important thing too. Isopods and springtails, I use them together. Um, so the springtails actually use the charcoal just as much, if not more. But let's go ahead and do this without the charcoal and we'll just set it up, the rest of it anyway. And what they're gonna eat is dead leaf matter. And then of course the waste of your animal, which is the whole point of them being in there in the first place. What I like to use is just magnolia leaves, dried magnolia leaves. These guys right here. And I just kind of uh, crunch them up a bit so they don't look out of place. It looks like a nice leaf litter. It looks pretty naturalistic. Um, and of course it gives the isopods a place to hide and it's their food source. I try to make it look so that it's natural, right? So you try to place them in a way that you think that it would look like in nature, so it looks like it's deliberate but not deliberate, so it looks just natural, I guess. So that's what I try to do here, and the nice thing about magnolia leaves is they have a green side and a brown side, so it's a little bit more um, color, a little bit deeper of a palette for the overall enclosure. So overall, I'm actually pretty darn happy with this enclosure. So. Our baby crested geckos will be able to go in here quite shortly actually. I'll let this kind of uh, grow out a little bit and then once I put the colony of isopods and springtails in there, they're going to solidify and fortify their colony as well. The plants will start growing and then there'll be a little bit of a cleanup crew starting to form as well and then the geckos will be able to go inside of there. We'll update you when that happens. But that's really it. You need a very few things. This entire build, including the enclosure, cost me under a hundred bucks. I think that in Canada, everything's really expensive when it comes to reptile stuff, even plant stuff. And being a guy who used to sell plants into the States, I know that you can do it for much cheaper than a hundred bucks. Just go to a place that doesn't use tons of fertilizer and treats their plants like kind of like an organic substance, like what they are. And then you're good to go. And I would of course make sure that you let it grow out for a little while just to make sure if there's any issues or any bugs or anything foreign, you notice it and you catch it. And you're almost better off putting the plants into a quarantine before you actually put them into anything. That is definitely the best bet. However, if you buy from a place which kind of treats their plants like a quarantine area and they have an area for these plants, then you should be good to go. So that's it. That's how you set up a Cresta Gecko enclosure. This could work for you know, your 10 gallon equivalent or like a 36 by 36 by 24. It's really up to you what you choose to do. Thanks for watching. I appreciate that. If you haven't hit subscribe already, I'd love if you did down there. And of course, because I do videos twice a week, that means that I'll see you on Thursday.